Do you love spending time with people? Do you love spending time with people? If Paul were here, and if we were to ask, Paul, Paul, what is it that, that consumes you? What is your passion? What do you enjoy doing in your free time? What do you exert energy toward? What are you willing to make sacrifices for? Do you know what he would say? People. He would say people. He would say, I want to be with people. I want to be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to see them face to face. I want to sit down and talk with them. I want to draw them out. I want to preach to them. I want to enjoy fellowship with them. This is what stands out so clearly in, in Paul's life. Uh, he is not just a brilliant mind uh, penning theological treatises. What these verses are about is what it means to have a heart for people. And he exemplifies this, and it stands out so clearly, this remarkable, pronounced passion for people. Not being able to see these people in Thessalonica was really hard for Paul. Really hard. Uh, look at verse 17. He says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, uh, referring to the fact that they were forced to leave town, they were driven away. Since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. He describes his departure there, look at the words, as being torn away torn away from them, ripped apart from them, like a child being ripped apart from his parents. Torn away presumes a very close attachment between Paul and these people. Some would say we don't want people to be too attached to pastors, we don't want to build them into pastors, but there's also the other extreme, and that is that there is no attachment to a pastor. If there's no bond uh, between a pastor and his people, if there's no feeling of being torn apart, as the text says, no weeping and displays of affection, as you have in Acts 20, when Paul is with the Ephesian elders, uh, if there's none of that, then you need to wonder whether there's, in fact, too much distance between the pastor and his people, which is surely the greater danger in our own day. In some denominations, the pastor changes churches on an average of three to five years. Uh, and people are encouraged, pastors are encouraged to keep their distance from the people in the church. Uh, some will even, some churches will intentionally every year rotate a new pastor in. Uh, pastors come and go so often in churches in our, in our day. Uh, and, and there's an assumption at times, that you don't want the pastor and the people to be built together too much. In complete contrast to that, you have the example of Paul, who is, as Carson says, a passionate man who is deeply enmeshed in the lives of real people. He loves spending time with people. Uh, look at what he says. We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. He's saying we made repeated attempts. We, we exerted great effort and energy to see you because that's how badly we wanted to be with you. In fact, we tried so hard that only Satan himself could keep us from you. See that at the end of verse 18? But Satan hindered us. What is, it, what is it that Paul exerted great energy toward? What is it, according to verse 17, that he was eager for? What was his great desire? What did he endeavor for? According to verse 17, it was to see you face to face. For Paul, spending time with others face to face was a priority in his ministry. Uh, there is an irreplaceable value in experiencing face to face fellowship 
with other believers. So yes, he could write them a letter, but it wasn't the same. There's, there's a unique value and benefit, a unique edification that occurs when you have face-to-face -face ministry uh, with others, face-to-face -face fellowship. You see it again in chapter 3, verse 10. They pray earnestly night and day that we may see you face-to-face, -face, same, same expression, and supply what is lacking in your faith. So apparently there's a connection between seeing other people face-to-face -face on the one hand and building people up in the faith and being mutually encouraged. There's a biblical principle that encourages us wherever possible to desire face-to-face -face fellowship with others. There's something about seeing people, spending time with people that benefits people in a way that nothing else can. I'm not opposed, I'm not opposed to the growing number of technologies that do exist to help people stay connected. So I'm thinking of texting and Facebook, email, Twitter, personal blogging. I realize these things can be a blessing. I benefit from some of these things. None of them are bad in and of themselves. And yet what I want to appeal is that we not be using these things thoughtlessly. Um, really, my, my concern is not only the, the massive amount of time these things have the potential to consume, but also that they can pose as a replacement for face-to-face -face fellowship and can therefore have the potential of detracting from face-to-face -face fellowship in the life of a believer. They can be a substitute for spending time in the real presence of real people. I mean, if you're if you're reading 30 personal blogs every day, along with following the tweets of 100 other people and doing email on top of that and spending a couple hours on Facebook every day, you know, every day of the day, I'm just like, I want to have a conversation with a, with a person. I want to sit down and talk face to face with someone. And it's because there is a unique benefit to this that can be found in no other thing. So not to bash these things, not to come against them, but what we are doing is elevating the priority of face-to-face -face fellowship. In fact, I think that the, the fact that there are so many people in American culture who are uh, addicted to these other things gives us as a church a unique opportunity to display for the world the meaning of true fellowship, the meaning of true relationships, the meaning of true community. In other words, while the world is texting and blogging and tweeting their lives away, we're doing hospitality, right? We're, we're sitting down with people. We're opening up our homes. We're meeting as small groups. We're, we, are, we are experiencing a degree of community of which this world knows nothing. We love spending time with people. Do you love spending time with people? What is your attitude toward meetings? Uh, what's your attitude toward community group meetings, toward other meetings where you have opportunities to interact with your brothers and sisters in Christ? I think these should be our favorite moments in the week. I think we should look forward to these moments. I think something is wrong if we find ourselves looking forward more to the quiet evening at home than we are the meeting with other believers. Certainly, I think we have deviated from the example of Paul in these verses, who loves to be with people, who wants to be with people, who desires this. It's because he loves people. I read this and I marvel at his example. I, I marvel at how his heart burns to be with people and to see them face to face and his great love for them. Alexander Strzok is a man who did an in-depth study on the biblical teaching of what it means to be an effective pastor. And he says this in his volume that he wrote on eldership. He says, the best elders are those who love people. The best elders are those who love people, love to be with them, and are fervently involved with them. And that's true not only of pastors, it is true of all believers. The best Christians, the best believers, are those who love people, love to be with them, and are fervently involved with them.